Hello, my name is Mike Ackerman, and I'm a genetic cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I also serve as director of Mayo Clinic's Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic, the Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory, and the Mayo Clinic Winland Smith Rice Comprehensive Sudden Cardiac Death Program. I'm delighted that you chose to join me for today's lecture entitled Genetics and Genetic Testing 101 Pedigrees, Penetrance, and Purgatory. Recently, the American Heart Association has acknowledged the challenges and deficiencies in the cardiology community with bringing genetics and genetic testing into the contemporary practice of both pediatric and adult cardiovascular medicine, and has sounded a call to action to improve our genetic literacy. This lecture has been designed to do just that, to improve your foundational knowledge of genetics and genetic testing and help increase the genetics IQ of the practicing cardiologists, other healthcare providers, and trainees who take care of patients with heart disease. I hope you enjoy it. Genetics and Genetic Testing 101, Pedigrees, Penetrants, and Purgatory. I hope you're ready for this. You're gonna enjoy this a lot. Now I'm conflicted. These are my conflicts of interest to disclose. I don't think they're particularly relevant to the issue at hand, but you can be judge and jury of that. More important to disclose are the following learning objectives. Over the next 40 minutes, I'm gonna help us recognize the various modes of inheritance. We'll differentiate between genetic penetrance and expressivity. We'll then categorize the various types of disease susceptibility, mutations, or now called pathogenic variants. And then I'm going to help us judge whether or not a single nucleotide substitution is a disease-causing missense variant or whether it's just background genetic noise. We're in genomic medicine. We have been in genomic medicine, precision medicine now for going on 17, 18 years. It is a testosterone-loaded adolescent, if you will, this, this era of genomic medicine. And here's the future, it's around the corner. Your personalized genome on a thumb drive for under $1,000. Have any of you done yours? I have mine, here it is. As my cardiologist, my healthcare provider, trainee in, in making, how are you gonna navigate this when I hand you my thumb drive? Where do you care that I have this silent, synonymous, single nucleotide substitution in the beta-1 adrenergic receptor? Do you care that I have factor V Leiden, otherwise known as arginine 506 glutamine missense substitution? Do you care, do you know, that I am MPB positive? Well, you can phenotype me and determine that. That's male pattern baldness. I was glad that I'm EDS negative. Do you care that I have the DD haplotype for the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE? How about that I have a variant in CYP2D6 that makes me a rapid metabolizer of CYP2D6 cytochrome P450, 2D6 substrates like metoprolol? Are you going to adjust my medication for rate control and so forth? How about that I have a variant in CYP2C9 that makes me a slow metabolizer, a poor metabolizer, or a warfarin? Are you going to adjust my anticoagulation uh, therapy? Do you care that I have this single nucleotide substitution, serine 1103 tyrosine, in the SCN5A encoded NAV1.5 sodium channel. Do you know whether you should care or not? Well, this isn't actually my genomics ID card. I haven't done my exome or my genome. Some of these may or may not be true, but this kind of medicine is not too far away. And unfortunately, our foundational underpinnings in cardiovascular medicine are suboptimal, are weak. We barely can speak the language of genomic medicine. Well, in 30, within the next 30 minutes, your language and your vocabulary will be much, much improved. Let's continue on. 
the Human Genome Project. This was really the launch pad of this era of precision medicine. It's now 18 years ago when it was completed. And this was then completed fully in 2003 at the price point of a buck a nucleotide. And it was declared one of the greatest feats of exploration in history, an inward voyage of discovery. And some of the cynics out there might suggest that ever since then, we've been in, in an outward journey of chaos and confusion. Well, here we will bring clarity to the chaos and help with the confusion by helping us better understand genetics and understand the questions to ask when we are considering genetic testing for our patients. Because it has come to cardiovascular medicine, there is much genetics much genetic underpinnings of our diseases in cardiology. We have a whole new specialty and development of genetic heart disease and specialists in the making called genetic cardiologists. And for the last seven plus years in the heart rhythm world, we've had guidance from our leading societies, Heart Rhythm Society here in North America, European Heart Rhythm Association across the pond, where we've received guidance on what's the state of genetic testing, not from a research perspective, but what's the clinical state of genetic testing for genetic heart rhythm diseases, the channelopathies, or genetic heart muscle diseases, the cardiomyopathies. So we have for the cardiomyopathies, the genetic underpinnings, and these are a fascinating collection of genetic heart muscle diseases that come in different phenotypic expressions as shown here. And we have the cardiac channelopathies, also known as the primary electrical disorders or the genetic arrhythmia syndromes for which long QT syndrome is chief. Now to help with understanding genetics, I wanna walk us through the outline. We're going to start with different modes of inheritance and make sure we understand pedigrees. We'll then look at summarizing the different types of incorrect hereditary messages causing human disease that used to be called mutations. Now we will use the more correct term of pathogenic variants. And then we'll examine what are the th three key principles of genetic testing that must be fully understood, respected, and applied to be a wise user and an even wiser, wiser interpreter of genetic testing. And before we start with pedigrees and the different modes of inheritance, let me give you a few questions to consider and we'll come back to these. Let's look at this pedigree, for example. You see shown is the individuals who are positive for the pathogenic variant of interest. The father, three of the four children, the father's parents are negative at the omic genetic level. And when you look at this, what's then the inheritance pattern? Is this X-linked recessive, autosomal dominant, sporadic, autosomal recessive? If you don't know now, you will soon know, and you do need to know what, what is the heritability of the various genetic heart diseases that we encounter. Question number two, you have a patient who tragically died from this disease. This is a post-mortem specimen of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Your patient, she has this disease and she is pregnant. What is the likelihood that her fetus will be affected by the disease? If you don't know now, you'll know, and you'll know clearly the correct answer in just a few minutes. When considering a pedigree like this, those who are mutation positive and those who are also phenotype positive, do you understand what is the penetrance of the disease in this pedigree? You'll be able to confidently answer this question in the very near future. And then this, look at this sequencing chromatogram. Now you and I have received genetic test results with words on them. You won't ever have to see the sequencing chromatogram, but here it is. And the patient of yours and mine has this variant L, leucine, 185R arginine in the TPM1 encoded alpha tropomyosin protein. Now, is this mutation shown below, is it 
known as a synonymous single nucleotide polymorphism. Number two, a missense mutation, or to be correct, a missense pathogenic variant, a nonsense variant, or a pointless one. If you're not sure, you will be sure in just a short time. So let's get going. Let's start with the different modes of inheritance. And let's take a close look to make sure we understand the two most common modes that we're going to encounter for our patients who have some sort of genetic heart or genetic vascular disease. And we need to step back to some basic definitions and principles and understand that inherited variation in the genome is the foundation of human and medical genetics and that alternative forms of genetic information at a particular location called a locus of the genome are called alleles. Now here's an example here. We have chromosome 15. We have one chromosome 15 from our biological father and one chromosome 15 from our biological mother. And you have the short arm, P, to the left and the longer arm, Q, to the right. And there on the longer arm is the gene, the Bay 2 gene, that encodes the eye color trait. It's the allele for brown eye color on top and the allele for the blue eye color on the bottom. And in this example, the allele for brown eye color is said to be dominant. In other words, you only need one of those and you're gonna have brown eyes. Whereas the allele for the blue eye color is here noted as recessive. To be blue eyed, you need both alleles to have the blue eye color. That's recessive. Now, for the man on the left and the woman on the right, men are squares in pedigrees, go figure that one, we have the genotype. That's the genetic makeup. And he is said to be homozygous because he has the same on for that Bay 2 gene. She is said to be heterozygous there. Now, what is the look? What is the trait? What is the appearance? In other words, what is the phenotype? He will be blue-eyed, she will be brown-eyed, because the brown-eyed allele is dominant. Now, of course, meiosis occurs and co-mingling occurs, and we do that. And then we end up with offspring, some blue-eyed, some brown-eyed. Well, here we're just talking about eye color, no big deal, but that's the exact same thing for our genetic heart disor disorders because these are characterized by their patterns of transmission within the families. Now, there are other modes of inheritance, but the four basic modes that we have to understand is autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and then the sex-linked of X-linked dominant and X-linked recessive. And for the most part, we can confine our focus and understanding to making sure we understand autosomal dominant mediated genetic heart diseases, which are most of our diseases, and autosomal recessive. Now, these patterns are based mostly on two factors, aren't they? First, what type of chromosome the defective gene is located on? Is it on the autosome or on the X chromosome to make it X-linked? And then second and most importantly, whether we're talking about eye color or whether we're talking about a disease susceptibility variant, the determination of whether the disease is expressed only, only when two abnormal alleles are present, then it's recessive. Or if, if the disease can be expressed, even with just one abnormal allele, then that's dominant. Now we need to pause here and make sure we absolutely understand this. If a single allele is capable for the possibility of disease expressivity, that is dominant transmission behavior. Then we end up with pedigrees, and let's look. We'll start with the less common one in cardiology, but perhaps the most common pedigree that we learned in medicine for a disease like cystic fibrosis, where the mode of inheritance is autosomal recessive, and we can see that we have some who are heterozygous for the B bad allele and the G good allele. And we have those who inherited both bad copies from their heterozygous parents. In autosomal recessive, those who are bad, bad, now 
are those with disease expression in the case of cystic fibrosis having inherited say for example the most common cystic fibrosis causative pathogenic variant the delta f508 deletion variant in cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator cftr they with the double dose bad bad those are the ones with cystic fibrosis the others who have just one copy of the bad allele the bad gene they in this case are called carriers and you can see transmission risk here for the if we have a carrier father and a carrier mother marry one another then there's a 25 percent chance with each offspring that there will be there will be bad bad and this is autosomal recessive in contrast, for most of our heart diseases, we're dealing with autosomal dominant transmission, in which case you see those here with a bad copy. Only one bad abnormal allele is required to have the possibility of disease. See? Look. Look closely. They all have potential for disease. They, unlike the BG individuals in the previous pedigree, are not carriers. Don't use that term. They are variant positive, mutation positive, for an autosomal dominant disease process for which, at the top, the patriarch has a 50% chance of transmission to each of his progeny. Half of his sperm will contain the bad copy, the other half will not. For the children produced there, you see to the left, BG daughter. She could show the disease. She's not just a carrier. She is variant positive. And now for her children, each child has a 50-50 disease transmission risk of the disease susceptibility variant. Will they show the disease? Stay tuned. That's another critical concept called penetrance. So for here, remember, never, never, never. Use the term carrier for an individual hosting an autosomal dominant disease susceptibility mutation or variant. In fact, you could use that term only if you knew that that pathogenic variant in that individual is associated with 0% penetrance. Then I suppose the word carrier is acceptable. Short of that, and we virtually never know whether the person's penetrance is at zero, then stay away from this term. These individuals, that individual here, is not a carrier. He is a mutation positive subject or a variant positive subject. Will he show disease or not? That answer is, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. And only if you knew that the penetrance for him was 0%, could you call him a carrier? That brings us to penetrance. We did pen pedigrees, now we need to do penetrance. And penetrance here is defined as the percent of the mutation positive or likely pathogenic variant or pathogenic variant positive subjects who exhibit the objective marker that heralds the presence of the disease caused by that genetic abnormality. Let's illustrate. Here's an example, stem to stern, of type 2 long QT syndrome caused in mutations in the KCNH2 encoded KV11.1 potassium channel. And you can see they are scattered topologically across this ion channel alpha subunit. And here's one particular single nucleotide substitution, a single amino acid substitution, a missense variant, arginine 176-2W tryptophan, where we have learned that the penetrance is 16%. What does that mean then for people who are LQT2 because of the presence of R176W-KCNH2? Well, we know then that 84% of these individuals who are variant positive for this variant, that they have a normal QTC. 
So we're talking about the objective marker of the disease. If we're talking long QT syndrome, the objective marker is what is their QTC at rest? If we're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we're talking what is their maximum septal wall thickness? Now, of course, some are gonna have age dependence of expressivity because the wall thickness may not hypertrophy until later in life in somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example. Really wanna make sure you understand penetrance and what it means to be penetrant. Because in our diseases, in genetic heart diseases, we are underscored by incomplete penetrance. Therefore, unless a disease susceptibility mutation pathogenic variant is 100% penetrant, our counseling for our families should be if the disease will ever show itself rather than when. This is critical, and we must communicate this clearly because we cannot have families under the assumption that if they do cascade testing and their infant child is shown to be positive, that we've assigned the death sentence. Because what that child is positive for, what that relative is positive for, although it might be expressive in one family member, may be completely silent, dormant, non-existent in another variant positive relative. Incomplete penetrance is the hallmark of genetic heart diseases. The other hallmark is shown here is that of variable expressivity. Let's assume for a moment that we are 100% penetrant for the disease susceptibility variant or those shown here who are mutation positive. Now, even though if they are mutation positive for long QT syndrome, and even though every one of them, by definition, would show a diagnostically abnormal QTC at rest, or if we're talking hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and every one of these mutation positive relatives would show an echocardiogram that reveals a diagnostically abnormal septal wall thickness greater than 15 millimeters, for example, that doesn't mean their story is going to be the same. Penetrant, yes, but variably expressive. So in this example, they might be showing the abnormality, showing the phenotype that declares them as penetrant, but be completely asymptomatic. Others may have had sudden death by age 10 already, and some may have just fainted. So even in a family, in an autosomal dominant family, where the variant is associated with high penetrance, such that when you phenotype them, they all show evidence of the disease objective marker, they may not, and usually do not, have the same storyline, ranging from asymptomatic longevity to tragedy at a young, young age. Let's remember penetrance and expressivity. Now let's turn our attention to this to summarize some of the different types of incorrect hereditary messages that can cause disease in cardiovascular medicine. Let's see what happens when things go wrong. Now at the genome level in cardiology we have genome mutations. We take care of patients with these where it involves the abnormal segregation of chromosomes during cell division. Anybody have an example to shout out in your living room? All right, trisomy 21, Turner syndrome, XO. We encounter that in cardiovascular medicine. We mostly won't be talking about that. Or with chromosome mutations where there are major portions of chromosomes that may be deleted or duplicated. We have that in cardiovascular medicine, don't we? Do you know? Of course. DeGeorge syndrome, velocardiofacial syndrome, chromosome 22 Q11.2 micro deletion syndrome. And so we have this kind of mutations that can cause genetic disease. But when we think of genetic testing and for the rest of our time together, we're really gonna be thinking of mutations in genes. And these gene level mutations where we have the production of disease susceptibility as a result of a gene mutation. And for the most part, these gene mutations reside in the coding regions of the genes, the business of the gene, the exons. These gene mutations involve changes at the nucleotide level, and they disrupt the normal function of a single gene product. 
and there are several types as shown here. The single most common disease-caused variant or mutation in a gene, in a disease susceptibility gene, whether it's a LQTS susceptibility gene like KCNQ1 or an HCM susceptibility gene like MYH7 or a ARVC ACM susceptibility gene like PKP2. The single most common is this category, is this type called a missense mutation where you exchange one amino acid for another. Then there are nonsense mutations, which at a molecular level are more radical because they cause one amino acid to get exchanged into a stop codon. We have in-frame deletions or insertions, which involve a removal or addition of amino acids from the protein. There are frame shift mutations, also radical at the molecular level, because they drastically alter the reading frame of the transcript and usually result in a non-intelligible product, a premature truncation of the protein, a scrambled protein, a dysfunctional protein. These are viewed as loss of function mutations. Most of them are deleterious, but not all frame shift mutations are. And then we have splice site mutations, which disrupt proper RNA splicing. Let's look at a couple examples. Let's look at a frame shift mutation and see why it's viewed as radical on the molecular level. Here's a, a mock codonic sequence. You know, we have codons of three nucleotides and they build one of 20 essential amino acids and there are three then stop codons or in here the TGA codon that encodes stop. And here, look, there you have at nucleotide eight, the third codon, a deletion of T. And as we all, you see that frame shift? Did you see that? That frame shifts, let's look at that again. That frame shifts right there. And when you remove it, the downstream shifts over and often you'll result in a premature truncation of the protein after a series of scrambled or frame shifted amino acids. Is that deleterious? Well, let's take a close look. At least in this codonic sentence in English, you can see what happens to a single nucleotide deletion causing a frame shift in an unintelligible sentence. Similarly, most frame shift mutations in biology do the same. But now let's take a closer look at a missense mutation or a missense variant where you just have a single nucleotide being substituted out. Here in codon four, nucleotide 11 is being switched from C to T and now we have proline as the normal encoded codon turning into leucine, proline for leucine, or in short, P4L. Is this deleterious? Is proline for leucine gonna be disruptive when upstream, the previous three codons are intact, and downstream, all the rest are intact as well? Only there, only there at proline four has a mistake occurred. Has it been mutated? Will that be deleterious? Well, in English, if you do it, it depends on what happens to the meaning. See what happens when we go from cat to hat? Of course it has different meaning. And this, of course, that we see in English, unfortunately, we don't always get in biology because we don't have a functional decoder that immediately tells us what is the functional consequence of that single nucleotide substitution. So here is proline for leucine, disease cause, a, a disease causative variant. The answer, as we're gonna to come to, is absolutely it is. Um, sometimes, maybe, perhaps, I need to know more. And we're gonna to try to unpack all of that in the next little bit as we consider the key principles of genetic testing for the final few minutes of our time together. When it comes then, have this foundational insight of pedigrees and penetrance and expressivity and understanding the language of genome mutations, chromosome mutations and gene level mutations and having an insight as to what it does at the gene level by missense or frame shift or splice site, we now have to say, I'm ready to do genetic testing. 
And you are not ready to do genetic testing until and unless you are comfortable with these three questions and you know the answer to these three questions for your patient and for the disease process that you are considering in your patient. These three principles or the three questions are here. What is the test, diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic impact? Second, what is the genetic test for that phenotype, for that disease you're considering? What does that genetic test yield? And the third is what is that test's dark side? What is its Achilles heel, its noise? And unless you're comfortable with these questions and their answers, you need to be very careful with the use of genetic testing. Let's look at the first one. The short answer is, what is that test impact across the triad in medicine? Ought to be, it depends. It depends on what disease are we talking about because finding it, it in this case is a single nucleotide substitution, a missense variant, a disease caused of missense variant, depends on what disease process are we talking about. And you can see here for some diseases in the world of genetic heart disease, genetic heart rhythm disease, genetic heart muscle disease, like atrial fibrillation, the impact of genetic testing is still un poquito, not much. In contrast, the, the poster entity is long QT syndrome, where the knowing the genetic test result impacts the triad diagnostically, prognostically, and even therapeutically, where we think about patients with type 1 long QT syndrome differently than we think about patients with type 2 long QT syndrome. And this impact across the triad evolves. So you can see here, look at that for DCM, kind of a lukewarm reception eight years ago. And now, eight years later, it probably gets and deserves a single plus across the triad because knowing it is impactful uh, in certain situations, particularly if we're dealing with dilated cardiomyopathy secondary to a laminopathy or an LMNA mutation. So the answer is it depends on what disease are we talking about. It may or may not be static. It usually is going to be dynamic as our knowledge grows and we need to know how is that test answer going to help me. It doesn't have to help me in all three categories, but it better help us in one or more. Otherwise, it's not ready for clinical utility. Then the second question that we have to know the answer to is, what does the test yield? This goes into the pre-test genetic counseling where you are certain of the disease phenotype. Say you know your patient has HCM, you know your patient has long QT. What's the likelihood that the genetic test will come back positive, revealing the disease causative variant? Now, this yield doesn't have to be 100%, and in fact, it almost never is 100% for any of our diseases. And it doesn't have to necessarily be high at all. You could potentially have a disease process where the yield of the genetic test is 1%. But if you are that 1% and the therapeutic impact of knowing you are that 1% is substantial, that genetic test could still be a worthy and a worthwhile genetic test. So it's not the raw number that makes the test appropriate or not. The reason you and I need to know the yield is so that we are well aware of how much of the disease is currently captured by present day knowledge in our genetic code and how much of that disease process remains genetically elusive. Let's look at in the cardiac channelopathies, just to have a frame of reference of the different yields of the genetic test. So here we have, in the case of the major channelopathies, where you know your patient has long QT syndrome, the genetic test should come back positive. If that diagnosis is spot on correct, 75 to 80% of the time. So approximately 20% of long QT syndrome is genetically elusive. So if I know my patient has long QT syndrome and the test comes back negative, I'm not going to change my mind about the diagnosis. On the other hand, 
when you have a single diagnostic marker, in this case called the long QT genetic test, that by itself captures 80% of the disease and it comes back negative, thereby ruling out 80% of the disease, it is always worth a pause and say, am I sure about my phenotypic assessment and the robustness of my clinical diagnosis of long QT? If yes, yeah, then no problem. They go into the category of genetically elusive long QT syndrome. But with a yield like that, that high, it is worth a relook at the certainty, the veracity of the clinical diagnosis. That's one of the reasons why knowing the yield can be so impactful. CPVT, we have almost two thirds of catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia genetically explained. Brugada syndrome, 10 to 40%, and in a future lecture, we're gonna to have to really look into this because the whole genetics of Brugada syndrome is, at least monogenetics of Brugada syndrome is collapsing. And short QT syndrome, short topic, not very much of it genetically accounted for. So you need to know what is the test diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic impact. We need to know what is the yield of that genetic test being considered for that disease that I think my patient has. And then third and finally, we need to know what is the test Achilles heel. What is its noise? And let's pause for a second and think about our master physicians who trained us. For me, in my life, one of the things that I think characterizes them is no matter what test they ordered, whether it was the ECG, the echo, the nuclear scan, the EP study, genetic test, biomarker, they, the best master physicians, are acutely aware of the downside of the test. In other words, the signal to noise ratio. And we should be signal to noise minded in genetic testing as well. Because remember this example, this missense variant, the single nucleotide substitution in codon four, nucleotide 11, proline four leucine. How sure are we that proline four leucine is a disease causative pathogenic variant? Or are we gonna call it a likely pathogenic variant? Or are we comfortable to say it's benign or likely benign? Or do we leave it in the American College of Medical Genetics class three designation as a variant of uncertain significance? There's noise in our genetic code. We don't have this functional readout readily available to us like we do in the English language where we know if we make a single nucleotide misspelling, if you will, the meaning's altered. Because it all comes down in genetics and disease causative genetics as to is proline 4 leucine disruptive to the biology of that encoded protein and disruptive enough to alter the meaning enough that going from physiology, we go to pathophysiology. That's what it's all about. And for some, our proteins tolerate lots of amino acid substitutions, and it gets the job done very fine. Thank you very much. Others, you do this to that protein, and it bothers the protein's biology a lot and bothers it enough to confer susceptibility, vulnerability to a disease phenotype. Long QT, CPVT, Brugada, HCM, you name it, it can cause it. And again, this kind of single nucleotide substitution is the single most common class of mutations for all of our genetic heart diseases. In genomic medicine, in this era that we're in, we have got to realize that in genetic testing, it's no different than almost every other diagnostic modality we utilize where we have the maybe test result. Do we have maybe test results with the ECG? Yeah, how about borderline QT prolongation? Do we have maybe test results in echocardiography? Yeah, how about hypertrabeculation of the ventricular myocardium? How about athlete heart status? We have the maybe results in all of our diagnostic modalities. Genetic medicine is no exception to that. And we need to be clear in our words. We used to call these possible deleterious. That I never liked. 
Which are we referring to? Possible or deleterious? I kind of like to know, wouldn't you? Then we have the, the vulgar expression in genetics, which matches the vulgarity of borderline QT prolongation in electrocardiography, right? We have the variant of uncertain significance, or the VUS, which, as I mentioned, is now designated as American College of Medical Genetics Class Three variant. In a future lecture, I'm going to expose the variant of uncertain significance issue because it's not an issue. It's actually the VUS crisis. And I've called this crisis and given it a place and a name called genetic purgatory. I'm going to help you in a future lecture fully understand and believe in this place. It's a real place. It's a scary place. And significant mistakes are being made to our patients because of our failure to understand where that variant, what that variant is, and to have it appropriately and properly classified and understood and realize that that classification is not static. It may change. What is stuck in purgatory today may be freed in the future. Or what is stuck in purgatory today in a nanosecond by just looking at a few things could be demoted fully deep into Dante's Inferno as a nothing variant. Why did we even think about this? So we need to better understand this variant of uncertain significance issue because genetic purgatory is alive and well and it's not only getting filled up with variants of uncertain significance, it's getting the company of genes of uncertain significance or GUSs, where published disease-associated susceptibility genes are having to be re-reviewed, re-understood in the light of current knowledge and reclassified, many of them, as not so fast. Maybe these genes aren't disease-worthy after all. Maybe we need to go back and mount additional evidence and have these genes stuck in ambiguity as well as many variants in the irrefutable disease susceptibility genes. Stay tuned for that lecture on the vuses and gusses that are filling up genetic purgatory. But this now brings us to the end of this lecture where I do hope we've achieved mission accomplished deliverables here for the four learning objectives. Are you able to now recognize the various modes of inheritance? I hope so. I hope I've been able to illustrate and differentiate the concepts of penetrance and expressivity. I hope you can categorize the various types of disease susceptibility variants and can start to wonder or judge whether that variant is disease causing or whether it's background genetic noise, or at least be aware that this issue exists so that you put the pause button on the genetic test result and take a careful assessment of the information yourself. So with these learning objectives achieved, let's go back to the questions at the beginning and see if you can do the shout out of the answers. Remember this pedigree? You can see from this pedigree, variant positive father, three of the four children are variant positive. What is the inheritance pattern? And you guys know now, yeah, of course. It is autosomal dominant. Now, bonus, where did it start? Variant negative paternal grandmother at the top, variant negative paternal grandfather at the top left. So in all likelihood, this is sporadic de novo in origin. There's less common things that we could talk about in future discussions like gonadal mosaicism. And then, of course, we have to remind ourselves of the possibility of non-paternity and for equal uh, consideration, non-maternity. Although it almost always is non-paternity when that is being considered. Well, I think we've got number one nailed down. Autosomal dominant here, 50% transmission risk to his children, started in him most likely after conception as a spontaneous germline, otherwise known as a de novo mutation. Good job. Autosomal dominant. Here we go. Remember this disease? Postmortem, yep, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mode of inheritance? 
Yes, you got it. Autosomal dominant. That makes you think back to what is transmission risk. And so your patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She's pregnant. What's the likelihood that her fetus will be affected by the disease? I prepped you to be ready for an immediate answer to say autosomal dominant, 50% transmission risk, bam, I know this answer. Well, not so fast. And I'm trying to trick you intentionally because to remind ourselves of the critical difference between gene transmission risk and owning the disease susceptibility variant, in this case, of course, that's a 50% transmission risk from the operative word affected, where being affected hinges on what is the penetrance of that disease susceptibility variant. So unless we knew the penetrance, the transmission risk status, yes, we know that, 50%. The affected is actually uncertain. Time will tell. Let's watch closely. It depends. Remember? Let's alter it just to be sure. She's pregnant has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what's the likelihood that her fetus will inherit the disease susceptibility variant? That, you of course, is 50%. Penetrance, transmission risk, really important concepts. Then here we have the example of those who are mutation positive and those who exhibit the exhibit A phenotype, the characteristic objective marker for that disease process under consideration. So who shows the diagnostic QT prolongation? Who shows the diagnostic hypertrophy and so forth? And in this case, we have those who own the variant, the disease causative variant, they're mutation positive, and those who show it, three of them show it. So what is the penetrance of the disease? Well, then that's just less than 40%. Those who are mutation positive and phenotype positive, three of them, divided by the rest, meaning those who are mutation positive. See that person in the right who doesn't have the mutation but shows the phenotype. What is that? That's bonus. Anybody? Yep, that's a phenocopy. More in the future. But here you nailed it. Three, three, one, two, three out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight who are variant positive. Three out of eight, less than 40%. And here we are rounding it out. This single nucleotide substitution gives you that single amino acid substitution, L185R or leucine 185 arginine in the gene TPM1 that encodes the protein alpha tropomycin. And what is that kind of mutation? Of course, clearly now the single most common subclass of disease causative gene mutations, the missense mutation, which involves a single nucleotide being substituted, resulting in a single amino acid being substituted to a different amino acid there and there alone. Upstream intact, downstream intact. A missense pathogenic variant. And with that, I can't help but share and acknowledge uh, the entities that support and partner with us in Mayo Clinic's Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and our Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. So indebted and grateful to their support for our program, in particular, the philanthropic support from a beautiful family uh, in honor of their daughter, Winland Smith Rice, that helps us, partners with us, to be part of a life saving and life giving mission to heal the sick and advance the science. And if, if this genetics and genetic testing 101 has whet your appetite and made you really interested in genetic heart disease, join us. I'd love to have you join us for this course coming up uh, in October. Love to have you there. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this presentation as much as I enjoyed providing it for you. If you are interested in learning more about genetics, genetic testing, and genetic heart disease, I invite you to join me 
at our next Mayo Clinic Department of Cardiovascular Medicine CME course on the genetics of heart and vascular disease. For more information about this course, please check us out at cveducation.mayo.edu. That's cveducation.mayo.edu. On behalf of Mayo Clinic's Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and the Mayo Clinic Winland Smith Rice Comprehensive Sudden Cardiac Death Program, thanks for joining me today.